Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to to come to come to McGill. I was also mentioning to uh, Dominique. I I wandered through this building also a long time ago, not knowing he was here, uh, and I didn't find anyone. So I just uh, well, it's uh, better to see a lot more people and uh, many familiar faces today. So thank you again. Uh, so before, uh, uh, I must also thank the previous presenters for providing such a good framework uh, in terms of the local challenges, local needs, but also some of the possibilities that were mentioned in the last presentation. I'd like to take a step back and then, uh, and again, some of the themes that will, uh, will also feature in my presentation is, uh, is integration and connectivity between different uh, demands and needs and also what, what, we can, uh, what we could possibly do to address some of those needs. So taking a step back, uh, let's look at sewage treatment, let's look at waste treatment uh, from a very, very broad perspective, uh, even an elemental perspective, if you will. And so uh, this is familiar to all of you, but I thought I might just uh, uh, introduce it this way, uh, uh, perhaps, to, perhaps to kind of give this some structure, at least. And so when we, when we talk about sewage treatment, wastewater treatment, essentially at a, at a very high level, we are basically taking out inerts, uh, debris that, that cannot be biologically converted, biologically processed. Uh, and then whatever is remaining is essentially processed biologically. And whatever is remaining, again, if you want to take a high level perspective, it's essentially carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We can uh, take a look at where the carbon comes in, at what oxidation state, what nitrogen comes in at, and phosphorus, and so on. And ultimately, what we are doing is removing, removing based on local regulations, uh, we're removing either all of them, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, or some of them. And uh, if you take now, if we take a detailed look, essentially our model of removing carbon, removing carbon from the aqueous phase, removing nitrogen from the aqueous phase, these are all biological processes, but these are all net oxidative processes. If you really want to take a look at uh, where the carbon comes in, it comes in at a very neutral oxidation state on average. Removal of carbon is by virtue of converting that to carbon dioxide, for the most part, through aerobic technologies. This is what Dominique mentioned. And uh, aeration, of course, then results in a high footprint in terms of energy requirements and also in terms of greenhouse gas requirements, uh, uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gases as well that come into the picture. Nitrogen, the story is the same. Most nitrogen comes in, at least in domestic streams, not industrial streams, but domestic streams, at, in a reduced form. Uh, it could be organic nitrogen, could be inorganic ammonia, ammonium. And so how do we remove nitrogen? We remove ammonia, ammonium, by conversion to nitrogen gas. This is also oxidation. Large, uh, a plant could typically double the amount of oxygen required, the air required, to remove nitrogen as well. And then phosphorus removed also, combination of anaerobic aerobic processes. And this is all happening in, the, in, this, biological, in this biological reactor. Uh, there's a footprint associated with greenhouse gases, energy, resources, chemicals, and so on. And ultimately what we do is we, we recycle the bacteria back into the reactor. Depending where in the world we are, we could disinfect it, not disinfect it, and discharge it. So what we've, what we've done is we have, uh, of course, we've created a pathway now for for, for clean water, and, and we've done that. We, we do that, we do that fairly effectively in some parts of the world, we don't do that effectively in other parts of the world. But let's now come back into the reactor. We have achieved clean water, that's all. We just have achieved clean water, but that has come at a cost in terms of energy, in terms of chemicals, in terms of, uh, in terms of a footprint that we could attribute to CO2, but primarily non-CO2 greenhouse, non greenhouse gases, which is what we should uh, that's a different discussion, I guess. But, uh, but then what we do is, that's all fine, but then what we do is, we try to take this model and we try and put it in other places where they should not be, where they should not be uh, uh, in place, and uh, th there are some mistakes made. So this is a plant in a big city in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. This is one of the biggest U uh, upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor, USB uh, reactors. Uh, one of the biggest on the continent, actually. Uh, and, and it just doesn't do anything. It just doesn't work. It, not because the technology is not good. It doesn't work because there's no sludge coming into the system. So there are other externalities that we, that we totally forget in terms, of, uh, in terms of how to get the feedstock there, uh, what are the energy demands, what, are the, what, are, what is the network, what does the network look like if there even exists a network. And just to kind of, I know I'm exaggerating this uh, all to make a point. And so I've been to this plant a few times, and this is the Atlantic Ocean. I don't know if you can see this. This is a plume. I can see it on my screen. This plume is across the highway from this USB plant. Uh, there's a highway running, and uh, you can see it's right on the coast. The plant is somewhere here. The plant is running 
plant is just sitting empty and then all the fecal sludge that's meant to go into the plant gets dumped in the Atlantic Ocean, not because uh, of financial constraints, uh, totally other, other factors. No conveyance, no energy to run the plant and so on. And so let's, let's come back to energy for just a moment. Uh, Dominic had percentages, I have some numbers uh, in terms of uh, the energy consumed. Uh, again, just to look at look at differences. So, in the United States, the energy units here are somewhat somewhat uh, well unique to this sector. Teratons of oil equivalents. That's that's one way to express energy. This is the total uh, energy budget a few years ago for the United States, and this is the amount of energy uh, consumed for water. This includes distribution, by the way. So it'll it'll be more than the number you have. Uh, in some in in many parts of in many parts of the U.S. Uh, conveyance is by gravity, but in many other parts it's not by gravity, so there is some energy required there as well. Uh, just for reference, New York City, most of it is by gravity, so that's, we, we save a lot. Okay, so in any case, for, for the U.S., we spend about 0 0.07 uh, teratons oil equivalents on the water enterprise, let's say. Take this to Ghana, this is what they consume annually. Uh, accounting for population differences, surely. I mean, we're talking about vastly different populations. But they don't even have this amount of energy available that they can devote to the water sector. They just don't have access to energy. So w when we talk about waste management, uh, I, I, I know there were points made about, also Stefan made the points about uh, integration. This is a primary exa prime example of integration. Water, energy, and, and there is more as well. There are, there are the, the enterprise for clean water, the enterprise for waste management, includes energy demands, includes chemical demands. And, and so this is, that, this is something that, uh, that actually needs to be brought into the discussion, into, into some of these activities as well. Okay, so let's go back to the same blueprint for, the, for, the, for that plant that, I, that, that we discussed just a few seconds ago. So instead of, uh, in, instead of looking, this, looking at this in terms of removal of carbon, oxidative removal of carbon, oxidizing nitrogen and removing this, Perhaps there's another model. Obviously, there's another model. And so what are the different endpoints then? So we could look to recovering uh, not just energy, but chemicals. There was a very nice presentation in terms of different endpoints. Uh, I'll, I'll give some similar examples, but I'll keep it perhaps even more local by, uh, by let's say, proposing localized reuse, uh, production and reuse within the same boundary. And so yes, we can make chemicals. We can make uh, energy from the influent fairly concentrated, even we, before we put it into the primary, primary uh, separations. A lot of energy, a lot of chemicals possible to recover. The bioreactor is really the factory. We can just about do anything. Anaerobic conditions, aerobic conditions, or mixtures of these conditions as well. And then finally, uh, uh, we can do other stuff with the, with, with the temperature differentials. This is being done in, uh, in Scandinavia, where just based on a few degree differential in the effluent uh, water and the ambient temperature, there's a there's copious amount of energy that can be recovered. There's also a, a, a kinetic energy that can be recovered as well. Just to put things in perspective, Montreal was uh, 350 MGD. Uh, so the city of New York, higher population and translates almost one to one. Uh, 8 million people, 8.6 million people, 1.2 billion gallons per day. Uh, we, can, we can recover quite a lot of energy from just the flow also. So there's other, not just within the reactor, but outside the reactor as well. And then when we start talking about the sludge, this is, I think, this is, uh, this is a very highly concentrated uh, 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 feed stock for, uh, for recovery as well. Again, for chemical, not just energy, but chemicals as well. And then what do we get? We get clean water as the bonus. And uh, Dominic mentioned the, the far higher content of energy and now chemicals we can add as well in the waste, in the waste streams that we are trying to treat. Uh, if done properly, the enterprise for clean water can be the bonus rather than that being the only focus. We, if we do this properly, clean water becomes the bonus. And this really opens up the prospect of clean water and sanitation, not just, not just, in, uh, not just in Quebec, not just in the developed world, but, uh, but to many, many more billion people on this planet. And so let's, let's look at numbers as well. I, I apologize, I, I normalize these numbers to US units, so million gallons. Uh, I've, uh, it's taking me also a long time to get used to these units, but uh, anyway. So uh, let, let's just do a gross calculation. Uh, uh, the energy present, and again, there are many ways you can look, in, look at this in terms of energy present. Where are we recovering to? I'll, I'll explain this. So the energy present in sewage, uh, uh, I have on the left-hand side, it's 2,500 kilowatt hour per million gallons. And so what I did to, to calculate this number was to take just the organic carbon, not the nitrogen, not the phosphorus, just the organic carbon, 
convert that to convert that to biogas anaerobically, take take all the efficiency hits of now converting the biogas into into energy endpoints, and so upon doing all of that, we get this number, uh, normalized to a volume. This will differ because the loading, uh, uh, even though the loading may be same across continents, the concentrations are different in Europe or, or North America, for instance. But this is the number we have. Uh, uh, well, uh, contingent on a certain endpoint, biogas, and then and so on. Okay, and then now the energy needed not just to treat the carbon, but also the nitrogen and the phosphorus, which require more, much more energy than just the organic carbon. In that old model I showed you, the wastewater plant I showed you, that's nearly one to one. Uh, uh, the energy that we can that we can recover, even if we go to biogas and go to the most inefficient way to treat the wastewater. So even if we take these extremities, we are breaking even, and this is not. Uh, so here there is no exaggeration. We are. This is this is possible. And so again, if we try to go to, uh, if we increase the efficiency here of recovery, if we go to much better efficient ways of treating the wastewater, now we are becoming not just neutral but also positive. And this again, this again is reality. And there are, there are, there are a few large scale examples of energy neutral wastewater treatment plants uh, who do exactly this. They basically just take the carbon, they, not just the sewage carbon, but they also import the carbon in terms of food waste and animal waste. This uh, example is for East Bay Municipal Utility District near the Bay Area in California. And what they do, and there's a reason why they do this. Energy prices, the, the map that Stefan showed, there was clearly much higher than New York and uh, Boston, sitting was California, I think the number was 31, uh, I forget the units, but far higher. Uh, and so there it makes sense for that utility to convert to energy and sell that back into the grid. And then what they, what they unfortunately do is they take part of that energy and just treat the, uh, uh, and they, their plant is energy neutral, but what they do is they don't care about the nitrogen and phosphorus that is coming in not just with the sewage, but also with the waste they import. So they are making a lot of money on the energy, but then they are polluting, they are polluting the bay, and they don't have localized regulations. The plant across the bay has regulations, so in a way that is taking the hit for the, their activities here now, but now, Everyone realizes what's going on, so there are. I mean, we, we move beyond this disconnect over here. So again, even looking at the most elementary examples, it's pos it's, uh, it's possible. So my point here is: let's try and think beyond biogas. Uh, let's let's uh, and and then consider what opportunities that might open up for uh, for for this entire sector. So when we talk, when we say beyond biogas, let's look at advanced uh, advanced uh, high energy endpoints. Uh, chemicals and even uh, fertilizers as applicable to nutrients and nitrogen, phosphorus. And so today what I'd like to focus on is primarily on the carbon side and then a little bit uh, linking the carbon and nitrogen cycles, uh, biological carbon and nitrogen cycles for recovery and reuse. And so the first part is uh, focusing then on, uh, on anaerobic fermentation, not digestion, not going all the way to methane, but uh, let's say what happens just before methane. And then uh, uh, understanding fermentation, what the possibilities are in terms of uh, how to utilize the fermentation uh, products, uh, which, which we will go into. So these are short-chain volatile fatty acids. So short-chain meaning carbon-2, carbon-3, anything about C5, C6, mostly aliphatics, uh, all aliphatics, sorry, uh, mostly straight-chain, but some branch chains as well. Uh, and uh, these, are, uh, these are volatile, lower the molecular weight, more volatile they are. And they, they, these are just a fascinating platform for us, to, uh, uh, for us to do a lot of things, and I'll show you. And then finally, what can we do, what else can we do with biogas in terms of making chemicals, not just for the sake of making chemicals and then get stuck somewhere, but to use those chemicals within this boundary. And that's, I think, where some of the, some of the efficiency can be enhanced as well. So, so let's look at anaerobic digestion first. So this is really our foundation here. So when we talk about anaerobic digestion, this is essentially uh, a cascade of five processes. Uh, so uh, a cascade of five, five processes uh, coming down essentially from the breakdown of high molecular weight, high, uh, high particle size uh, uh, molecules to somewhat uh, their monomers, and then successive breakdown of the monomers to short chain volatile fatty acids, almost uh, down to acetic acid, which is a two-carbon carboxylic acid, and then fi and so these steps one, two, three, four. These are all catalyzed by bacteria. 
to the last step here, conversion of, uh, well, let me say production of methane because there are two pathways. The last step is catalyzed by a different group of organisms known as archaea. And really, in this overall cascade, it's the last step which is really the most sensitive uh, and, uh, in some cases, the process determining step. And, uh, and uh, as a consequence, this has some consequences on uh, how we design and run anaerobic digesters. Okay? Uh, now what I'd like to focus on is let's go back to the same schematic and let's just stop before uh, methanogenesis, at least for the first part of the presentation, and then we can go to what, what we do with bio, what else we can do with biogas. So uh, as I mentioned, the last step here, methanogenesis through acetic acid or, or CO2 and H2, that's really uh, one of the more slower steps. The organisms are a bit less, they're a bit more susceptible, they're a bit more sensitive. Uh, uh, so what can we do before, before we get to methane? What do we have before we get to methane? It's primarily a mixture, aqueous mixture, of, uh, of uh, short, chain, short chain volatile fatty acids, acetic acid, and maybe, let's say, a few other acids. And there's also CO2 and H2, which is, uh, which is produced. But if you look at the system here, uh, since these processes are a bit more, uh, uh, the kinetics are higher, and so the, the retention time, sorry, I should have mentioned this, HRT stands for the hydraulic residence time, or the retention time, it's an indication of the size of the system. So when I said HRT of 15, 10 days for digestion means a bigger reactor compared to a smaller reactor for fermentation. So in a high rate, in a, in a low volume process, we can just take out uh, the short chain fatty acids. We are not going to sacrifice too much in terms of methane because there will be other, uh, in fact, if you do this properly, methanogenic yields are even better if you, if you, if you uh, uh, have two stages, but. Uh, maybe not go into that much detail. But essentially with fermentation, we are getting to uh, acetic acid and a few other short chain acids. Point is, uh, fermentation is more advantageous because we are, we, are, we are upcycling the value. We are getting much more than just biogas, which is again a mixture of gases, 50 to 60% methane uh, and then and a few other gases as well. And then fermentation can be integrated within, uh, within schemes if, uh, if these designs can be, uh, can be done properly. What can we do with short-chain volatile fatty acids? And where can we produce short-chain volatile fatty acids from? That really is the essence of this slide. So let's look at this box over here. These are, let's say, acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, two, three, and four carbon, two, three, four carbons. Uh, so essentially, we can produce VFA from just about any feedstock, from just about any feedstock at a, high, at a very low retention time, small reactors, Okay, so that, that's flexibility in terms of the front end. Where can we, what are the different feedstocks? Just about anything. Some pre-processing required, but just about anything. And then what can we do with the VFA? I, I'm not gonna go through this. Basically, we can connect, connect to any pipeline that we need. Materials, chemicals, biofuels, fuels, and so on. So we can just about connect to anything uh, through the, through the volatile, uh, short chain volatile fatty acid platform. And, uh, and again, the point here is it's not a this or a that. We can do this and produce biogas as well. So again, uh, uh, trying to get far more value from, uh, from, uh, from uh, 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 just a wide diversity of uh, feedstocks. So I'll give you three examples uh, somewhat quickly then. And so the first example is uh, 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 we wanted to produce lipids. Uh, uh, maybe we can discuss this today or later on why we, as to why we wanted to produce lipids. Uh, it was not just to make biodiesel. Lipids, uh, uh, lipids are essentially uh, the, the glycerol ester of uh, fatty acids. So, so these are carboxylic acids, COOH, and then the alcohol esterified uh, triglycerides. And so we were interested in making lipids. Uh, we, were making, uh, we were interested in making lipids through non-algal platforms. Uh, because uh, we wanted to render this process a bit more flexible. Even uh, if we use heterotrophic algae, we didn't want to be stuck with uh, uh, some other considerations uh, with algae. So non-algal platforms were for, for lipids. And so what are lipids, fats? Uh, all, all waste streams have a mixture of lipids, fats, carbohydrates, sugars, and protein. So these are the three primary, for, for most uh, waste streams, these are the three primary carbon classes. And so, of course, we can, uh, we can say, why do we need to make more lipids? Just take the lipid fraction from these wastes. If we do that, I'll give you an example. With food waste, uh, notwithstanding the diversity of the different food uh, classes that we all consume, on average, about 9 to 12% uh, uh, of, the, of the organic carbon mass is lipids. So if we, want to, if we want lipids, if you want to recover lipids from this waste stream, that's what we can pull out. Our objective was not to stop there, 
we wanted to convert the rest of the carbon classes to lipids as well. And so that's what, uh, that's what we ended up doing. And so, uh, and this is our overall schematic. So this is organic waste. Uh, this is the high rate fermentation, two days, four days to produce VFA, VFA to lipids, get the lipids out and then go just about anywhere. And so most of the novelty here is conversion of VFA to lipids. Now I showed you what we can produce VFA from, just about anything, and lipids are just one example. And uh, so I, I won't bore you with the details. This is, our, this is our downstream platform, so production of VFA, conversion of the VFA to, uh, to lipids using, uh, this is a yeast uh, that we use, Cryptococcus albedus, and uh, essentially, let me show you the signature of the lipids we produce uh, under a variety of different conditions. Uh, glucose, which is what most people use as the benchmark, the point is we can do just as well, if not better, using VFA. Uh, our biological platform allows us to make, this is our lipid signature, basically, a whole bunch of different lipids. This is the carbon length, this is the uh, place and number of uh, uh, unsaid, so double and triple bonds. So essentially what we are doing is, again, not to get caught up in these details, essentially we are making palm oil. Lipids that have the compos the mixture of lipids that uh, is very similar to palm oil. And where are we making palm oil from? This example is from food waste. So uh, localized production, I think this was mentioned by some of the speakers, localized production of, of, uh, of, of, of a lipid mixture very similar to palm oil, and for us it was from food waste. And uh, before we realized what we were actually producing, we wanted to make biodiesel, and we made biodiesel. Our, our production cost was very low. And then we realized that there was higher value not converting to biodiesel, but taking the lipids uh, and, and doing something else. So materials synthesis, not just biodiesel synthesis, but uh, material synthesis, which takes us to a totally different level of efficiency. Uh, for those of you who are more interested in discovery and the, and the fundamental science, there is room here as well. Uh, the Cryptococcus albedus platform, we realized we didn't know much about it. There was not, the genome was not available, so we just we do this in our in our group as well. So we just we sequence the genome ourselves, and we just published this uh, this year actually. And so what this allows us to do is this is the entire metabolic map of the organism. Now we realize now that this organ organism not just accumulates lip, accumulates lipids, but it accumulates all sorts of other carbon compounds as well under different conditions. Now we have this information. We have the map. Now we can start to open up this platform and any other platforms that uh, that that we that we wish to interrogate. I'll skip this. Uh, let's go to the, and so the point here is again, with a flexible VFA-based platform, we are able to take uh, feedstocks, different feedstocks, and channel them to different endpoints, including fairly high value endpoints uh, beyond uh, uh, some of those that we have envisioned. And I'm running short of time. Uh, let's, go to, let's go to another example, totally different end of the spectrum here. This is our work in, uh, in, in Ghana. Uh, this is the reactor system I designed, and here again the point was to take not, not food waste here, but fecal sludge and animal waste combined uh, in a sequence of processes. Uh, each reactor here is 10,000 liters, so 120,000 liters capacity, and uh, uh, the, as, the, as the fecal sludge flows from one tank to another, uh, the point was to harvest the VFA here, harvest the biogas here, and uh, run the plant on the energy sources, the biodiesel and the, and the biogas recovered. Uh, why did we want to do this? I, it's not very clear here, but uh, this is the schematic. Ah, this is better. So essentially, where we did this, we, we did this in a dump site. Uh, this dump site has only one thing. It has a mountain of fecal sludge, and it has fecal sludge lagoons. It has no electricity, it has no nothing, no Wi-Fi, nothing. And so the only thing that's guaranteed is a truck of fecal sludge that comes in every two minutes. And so that's guaranteed. And uh, so what we did, but, but look at what we did here. We went from a system that does not, where there is no sanitation, to a system where there is yes sanitation. So the denominator is zero, right? So the benefits are quite substantial. So that's what resource recovery allowed us to do here, not just produce materials or energy, but to achieve, uh, but, to, but to facilitate sanitation. And that, I think, was fairly, fairly decent. And so, and then coming back to the developed world, this is one of my first projects in New York City. I used to work for a company, this is prior to coming, coming to academia, a company called Metcalf and Eddy. Some of you might know the name. It's part of AECOM now. And so here we are essentially doing sludge fermentation and not digestion, precursor to digestion fermentation, taking the VFA, putting it back into the wastewater treatment plant to remove the nitrogen. Uh, some of you might know, uh, perhaps I can mention, New York City has very stringent nitrogen discharge goals and uh, uh, we spend a lot on energy to meet the nitrogen permits. We spend a lot on chemicals 
Uh, at capacity, we spend $40 million worth of chemicals per year, which is not a whole lot considering 8 million people, but still a whole lot in terms of absolute numbers. And uh, we're able to offset some of that using fermentation. Again, the same model, fermentation to VFA, put the VFA back in the plant, remove the nitrogen. Uh, this, is, this is a bit more fundamental. The point here is, again, there is room for fundamental discovery-based work while connecting to, uh, to application. Skip this. And finally, maybe I should title this slide, I do not hate biogas. I like biogas. <laughs> so here the point is, what do we do with biogas? Uh, uh, of course, we can go for conventional applications. We have another technology here. This uh, technology received the Paul Bush Award in 2010. So we've been working on this for some time. Here we essentially convert the methane present in biogas to methanol. Uh, biogas can contain, uh, in addition to methane, it can contain CO2, it can contain moisture as well, which, uh, which makes even chemical cleanup a bit, bit challenging, even with chemical catalysts. Here what we do is we use, we oxidize methane, but not using methane oxidizing bacteria, we use ammonia oxidizing bacteria, which are integral to a nitrogen removal system in a sewage treatment plant. So in New York City, for instance, we have nitrifying bacteria, we have ammonia oxidizing bacteria, but look at the model that we pursue. We, we spend a lot of energy to, to, to uh, create these ammonia oxidizing bacteria, we make methane downstream somewhere, flare the methane, and then we buy $40 million worth of methanol or glycerol. And so this is what we are trying to disrupt. So we take the biogas instead of flaring it, putting it back into the reactor, using ammonia oxidizing bacteria to produce methanol. Now the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, as the name suggests, they oxidize ammonia for a living. That's how they grow. And they produce nitride, and they are helped by other bacteria that convert nitride to nitrate. So in this tank now, we have ammonia coming in, we have methane coming in, and we get a mixture of methanol and nitrite or nitrate. What can we do with this? You turn off the air and it goes to denitrification. So you've removed the nitrogen, not using entirely external carbon, but internal carbon that you might otherwise burn and, 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 and uh, waste. And so this is another model, quite fascinating because it now, now it, it combines, let's say, the way we treat carbon and the way we treat nitrogen, and this is also allowing us to realize some, some efficiencies. And so finally, so uh, what I would like to, I, I'm, all I'm doing is underscoring some of the previous presentations uh, in, saying that, uh, in saying there's a lot of potential in terms of the different feedstocks that, that, that uh, come our way as part of the waste sector. And uh, 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 there's a lot of room for, uh, for recovering not just the conventional products, but uh, some products that we don't even know that we can, that we can make. Uh, today. Uh, I think it needs an investment, time, effort, and science in terms of understanding what these organisms are even capable of doing. Once we do that, trying to, uh, uh, trying to realize their potential. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, uh, I'll just stop here. I'd also like to acknowledge the researchers who have worked on different aspects of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of what I presented. Thank you.